Greetings. This is Cisco Catalyst 9120 wireless access point, and the reason it's on my desk today is I got a call out uh, yesterday and went out there today to take a look at uh, an issue where they had poor Wi-Fi in a in a part of the building, and I could see that the wireless access point was offline and it wasn't drawing PoE from the network switch either. So I went up there, not sure whether the whether workmen had thrown the thing in the bin or whether the um, it was a fault of the cable, whether the cable had been cut. But it turns out what we had was this, and it's a rather moist box. They had a roof leak, and as you can see, it's seen better days. I have taken the screws out and poured the water out. It literally poured out. So, as you can see, inside it's a bit grim. I mean, it might still work. It wasn't drawing power. But I have known of these to be full of water and still manage to get working again. Uh, I think the easiest thing to do with this crusty specimen is to just throw it in the dishwasher. And I might do the same with this, but not with the board attached. So I'll remove the... Um, heat transfer pads and we'll take a look and see if we can get this off I assume this is pro this could probably go in the dishwasher as well then and then we'll uh, see what we can do but um, right let me get this board off first now that's the board loose let's bring the camera in so you can take a closer look at some of these connections. So these are colour-coded connections which go from the antennas on the, the base plate up to the, the circuit board itself. So most of them come here. There's one yellow tag which goes off to the side and there's a blue tag. Let's just bring that into view. There's the yellow tag which goes off to the side and there's a blue tag which comes off on this board on its own. To pop those cables off, it should be able to remove the board. And you've got these little tags on the board as well. These are actually little soldered on clamps, so the wire will actually pinch down into place. There we go, the board lifts off. Oh, <laughs> what's the underside of this going to look like? Ta da! Oh, God. Right, that will definitely need cleaning up. Uh, this, I think, yeah, the, the best bet for this thing is also to go, I'll take all the heat transfer pads off. Is that enough to bring it out now? Yes, it is. Oh, God. <laughs> Alright, and that's the other side of the the antenna board. And it's all looking pretty grim. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna bang all the I'm gonna bang the antenna around those in the dishwasher because I don't care as to whether this works or not. It'd be nice if we get it working again, but uh, it's not the end of the world. So just uh, take a look at what's inside. Right, and while the dishwasher's got that to contend with, I'm gonna get to work and just clean up this board. Just for the sake of it really and we can have a look and see what's on it I've got some flux remover, I've got alcohol, I've got and I don't just mean the uh, Canon McEwan's export uh, I do have um, isopropyl alcohol so let's just get to work on this board cleaning it up well, that's still pretty grim, but it's better than it was. A lot of the surface slime and stuff has come off. There's still a lot of corrosion, uh, but it's worth uh, taking a look. Anyway, this is the antenna board. I'll just bring this up, and you can see we've got a group of four antennas here, and then there are six dotted around the side. This one is, sorry, this one is the Bluetooth antenna, and these are dual band antennas around the outside with a fifth one for the extra module on the side. Uh, on the other side you can still see it's pretty 
pretty grotty. And also, I managed to break that wire off for the Bluetooth antenna. And by the time I managed to get it to fit back on, this wire is now too short. So if I do get the thing working, I've got to move that somewhere else. Probably you have it dangling up here somewhere just to uh, get some semblance of a, of a BLE antenna. The board is cleaner, but not right. Uh, you can see there's a lot of corrosion there, and you can see on the back as well. Now there's clearly still a problem with this board, as I've tested it with a power over ethernet switch and it still won't boot. It won't even draw PoE. First of all, let's take a look at a close-up of the board and see what's on there. Top side, we've got a bunch of ICs that data sheets are readily available for, such as the Broadcom Wi-Fi chips plus a load that is harder to find information for, which will no doubt keep the Foil Hat Brigade happy. Speaking of which, no 60 GHz capacitors to see in here, and definitely not mounted on the antenna board either. The latest thing to be afraid of is 60 GHz capacitors in these things apparently. Just wait till you hear about the 400 terahertz receivers built into every television made in the last decades that allow anyone with a matching 400 terahertz transmitter to take full control of the TV. Anyway, sticking with the top of the board, notice there are four Sky branded chips associated with one Broadcom Wi-Fi chip and eight with the other in a larger metal can. I may be wrong here, but I assume that's because one of the radios on this access point is a flexible radio. One radio is fixed to the 5 GHz band, which is often configured with a wider bandwidth for improved performance compared to radios in the 2.4 GHz band, which doesn't really have enough room for that. The other can run either as a 2.4 GHz radio, making this a dual band access point, much like the ones built into modern home broadband routers, or can run as a second 5 GHz radio, allowing devices to be load balanced between the two 5 GHz radios for improved overall throughput and overall user experience. The other thing that's on the top of the board is this card which has its own antenna. This is used by Cisco's Digital Network Architecture Analytics System, DNA Center. Another for the file hatters, despite plenty of documentation online. And offloads various things like interference detection to a separate radio instead of tying up the data radios. Flipping to the bottom of the main board, there are a handful of other ICs, most of which are readily identifiable, and in the vicinity of one of those ICs is where I've found a problem. Measuring across PD48 with a multimeter identifies a diode junction with a half volt drop, which isn't present across the other two, nor the three on the other side. These are bi-directional transient voltage suppressor diodes, so shouldn't normally show up as diodes at all unless one half has failed short circuit. I've tested PD48 out of circuit though, and it's fine. The diode junction is still detected when you test the pads on the board. Another issue is the capacitor PC40 measures a short of about half an ohm. Failed multi-layer ceramic? I've had that before. Nope. Testing it out of circuit once again shows that the capacitor is okay and the short is still on the board. There's an identical circuit on the top side of the board, and this doesn't have that issue, so it looks like one of the circuits is faulty. I've traced out that part of the schematic to try and see where the fault could be. Unfortunately, it's looking to be one quarter of the H-bridge. That's particularly awkward because the chip doesn't just have the 12 pins you can see here. It's also got four pads on the underside as well, and those are all the MOSFET drain connections. Might be a pain to get off, let alone refit another one. What I'm going to try first though is apply voltage across PC40 to see if I can get the fault to either burn out if it's just a whisker of conductive crud on the board or heat up if it's a faulty component. I need to get this the right way around otherwise the diode built into the MOSFET junction is going to short it out anyway and I can't use too much current as I don't want to burn out a track or a wire. What I should say here is if I damage this it doesn't matter. It's a wrecked access point. It's flood damaged. If I can't get it to boot it's going in the recycle bin it was going to go to anyway. And even if I can get it to boot, it's unlikely to go back into active service. It's more likely to be a test unit. I've got my connection ready to go. Let's see what we can do. And straight away we can see a hot spot on the board. And it's the MOSFET. That's cleared the diode junction fault there, and it's also cleared the short across PC40. It's worth trying it without that chip in just to see what it does. And the answer is nothing. There's no power of Ethernet being drawn by that port. 
is worth a go. These MOSFET packages are quite cheap, so I think it might be worth splashing out for one of these anyway, and uh, and see what happens if I replace it. It might still be dead, but uh, it's worth a go. MOSFETs have arrived, only about a quid a piece, but I needed to make the order up to 40 quid to get free delivery, so I've got a few other bits I wanted as well. The trouble is, I don't know what caused the MOSFET to fail in the first place. Did water cause the MOSFET to trigger when it shouldn't and shoot through? If that's all, then that's good. But if water caused something else to actually fail that I've not spotted yet, then that'll mean that if this manages to wake up the PoE supply, then it could just pop the new one. I guess we'll find out. question is, will that now power up? The answer is no, because that light would start flashing if it was going to start booting up. However, my PoE switch is now displaying that it is delivering PoE. So it's definitely getting power out to at least part of the board now. This is an improvement. Not enough to fully wake it up, but still. I've cut a load of footage here as it was just me poking and prodding at the board and scraping more bits with tweezers. There are a number of inductors dotted around the board forming part of what I presume are local voltage regulators. A lot of them have got zero ohm links nearby and I've not found any that are blown. Besides the 52 volts that's chopped up to feed the main transformer, there's 3.3 volts at the other side and a few other voltages, 1.8 and 0.8 at the others. With no data sheet, I can't tell what they should be, although I could check the voltages on some of the ICs against what they should have on the data sheet. Now, I was going to do that, but then I plugged in off camera. Let's see if it'll do it again now. Interestingly, it's displaying garbage. It's jabbering away on the console port. And then it does that. So it's it's gone a little bit further. What I've also noticed is the voltage on the USB port, although it's about 4.9 volts, as soon as I put this in, you'll see it. You may not even notice it then that would have flashed on and then that voltage would have dropped to a 0.7 so it's as though the, the regulator is shutting down very quickly and it's just the um, residual charge or it's very very sensitive and it doesn't even want to be able to drive a USB stick now which it ought to be able to. Something about the way it was chatting gibberish just now sort of rang a bell and you can see there was a sort of rhythmic pattern before that light turned red. Now if you press and hold this button when you power it up, it'll wait and I think if you wait more than about 10 seconds, it will boot to its default config. If you press and hold it longer for I think about 20 seconds, it will try to do a, it, it'll enter recovery mode and try to, to pull an image over a TFTP service. And at that point, that light would turn red and it was doing a count. It was doing a rhythmic pattern, almost as though it was counting up the seconds, which it does do. So, measured across here, this was only measuring 60 ohms. I've removed a very corroded component there, and it's gone up to about 500 ohms now, and it seems to be that now, when I power it up, it doesn't do that rhythmic pattern anymore. It goes past it.
You know, that's actually just brought up its Ethernet port. The switch is now showing that as an active port. It's almost like every time I boot this thing up, it seems to get a little bit further. It's still chatting absolute gibberish on the screen. But the fact it's brought up its Ethernet port means it might actually get as far as booting up. And when I did it earlier on, it just stayed but flashing like this forever. Now, while it's doing that, I'm just going to check. On the switch. Right, it's still seeing it as an IEEE PD. It's not recognized it as a Cisco switch, yet, a Cisco wireless access point yet. Connected at a gig, which means all those connections are good. Because if any one of those pairs was down, it would only connect at 100 meg or nothing at all. So it's still not a happy access point by any means. But you can see it's trying to talk to us and trying to connect. So where are we? We've got a console port which chats gibberish. We've got a USB port which can't deliver power. We've got an Ethernet port which works when it wants to. It's working right now. Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. And we've got an access point which, even if it's got a DHCP server available, it doesn't go to the discovery stage. That light should start traffic lighting as it's trying to find its way back to the main controller. It's not doing that. Well, I think I'm going to call it a day on this one. Uh, I may come back to it at a later date if I've really got nothing better to do. But as I said, it was I was only half expecting it to even boot up. It was good practice fitting a, chi a chip like that. So that's a win as far as I'm concerned. But that's it for now. I'll uh, just put it back together again. Clearly it's still not happy, but uh, it was worth a go, and uh, I may return to it in future. At least you know what's inside it now. Thanks very much for watching. <laughs>